God is about doing things so that our community might draw together, and then we also might draw God. It's kind of a dual part thing. I believe God works in two different ways at the same time, with us in Him and with us in each other. And so that's really what this morning is about. Uh, we're in the middle of this book of Jonah, and the reason I have this cityscape going crazy is because... I believe that Jonah chapter 3 is about what Jonah finally got to do in the city of Nineveh. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, we're in chapter 3 of Jonah. I've been going chapter by chapter for, uh, the, there's only four chapters in this book. And uh, we're, gonna, we're cruising through it. We're just over halfway point. But uh, do you ever get the feeling like the world is falling apart? Yeah. I mean, really. Do you, do you think that the world... Uh, it's falling apart kind of every day as we go. I get this magazine, Time Magazine, and the cover says, The Cold War II, uh, the West is losing Putin's dangerous game. I don't know what you believe politically. I don't even know what Time Magazine is politically, but uh, we get it because we've got a free subscription. And so I'm reading this, and I'm like, wow, look at all the crazy things that happen in the world. I mean, how many commercial airliners have to go down before we, before we get our attention? You know what I mean? Commercial airliners like these Malaysia airlines that got that was missing a year ago, and other Malaysia airlines that got shot down by uh, Ukraine, um, all kinds of airlines that are people are just dying innocently. Or how much does this Ebola disease, this Ebola thing that's happening in Africa, how many people does it have to kill before we get our attention? You know? Or really, another question is how many countries have to go to war? before we start to really see what is God doing in this world. It just seems like the end of the world, like Judgment Day. Like, uh, did you go to the Greeley Stampede Parade that was just out here? I think there was a guy on the 4th of July that was walking by with a sandwich board on. I didn't get to see what the board said. What did the board say? Like, the end of the world, or repent and believe in Jesus, or that's kind of what Jonah, that's what his world was like. Welcome to Jonah's world. If we think that uh, our world is bad now, the, the reason it is uh, partly so bad and that we know about everything is because we have technology that tells us everything instantly, right? Your phone will buzz or click or some email or something will come on that will tell you uh, what's happening in the world. In Jonah's day, they didn't have that, but the world was just as bad. The Assyrian people, the people that lived in this town of Nineveh, there were 120,000 of them, and they were destroying the world around them. Uh, if you've been here for the last couple of weeks, I've been telling you that these Assyrians would uh, decapitate people, they would dismember people, they would do things. This army, the, these people were just decimating people around them, and God had had enough, and so God had told Jonah to go. Here's a little catch-up on where we've been. Uh, God wakes up Jonah, and he says, I need you to go to this town of Nineveh and tell them that their days are numbered. In fact, I'll give them 40 days to turn it around. Be nice if we had a 40 day turnaround sometimes, right? And uh, so Jonah, instead of going, he goes the other way. He runs the opposite way. I've showed you a couple maps if you've been here before, but Nineveh was, is up in Iraq. It's, uh, it was in the Assyrian province, and it's about a 500 mile walk for Jonah. So instead of going up into the east to Assyria, to uh, Iraq, he gets on a boat and he tries to go to Tarshish, which is in the Gibraltar State, uh, Strait, which is like where Spain is and the tip of Africa, where the Gibraltar Strait touches like this. He gets on a boat and tries to go to Tarshish, which is, I don't know, how many miles? 2,000 miles by boat. And so as he's running away, God creates a storm. Um, you've heard the story before. Jonah uh, um, is like, okay, it's my fault. And then all the sailors get converted. They come to God. They say, pray to your God. And then Jonah doesn't even pray to his God. He says, well, throw me overboard and God will stop the storm. So they do, and the storm stops. So they all repent and believe in this God that wasn't their God. And now Jonah's drowning in the sea. And this fish swallows Jonah. You've heard the fish story before. And Jonah finally turns around after a couple of days, three days in the belly of this fish, and he turns around and he repents to God, and he says, God, all right, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I'll go, to, I'll go to Nineveh, I'll do what you want me to do. And so that's where we ended last week, was this fish vomits Jonah out up onto the shore. Now, we don't know how far the shore was from where Assyria is, or where Nineveh is. It's still a 500-mile walk, so we ended last week by saying that uh, just because you do God's will doesn't mean it's easy. So Jonah still had to walk 500 miles. 
How many of you have walked 500 miles? Yeah. And so he's walking, and he finally gets to this town. And that's kind of where we get caught up. And my question this morning is, don't you think it's easier just to obey God the first time he calls you? I mean, wouldn't it just be easier to just say, oh, okay, God, you want me to do this? I guess I'll do it. Instead of fighting, resisting, all that stuff. What kind of a teenager were you as a kid? Were you a resistor? Were you a fighter? Was, was your resistance like rising up against your parents all the time? Did you run away from them home? Did you try to always fight them? That's what Jonah was. Instead of that, God calls us to obey the first time and to walk with God and things will go well with you. They'll be difficult, but they'll go well. I got four points that I'd like to talk about in this chapter three that uh, if you want to follow along, if you want to um, read in your scriptures or if you want to fill in the blanks on those notes there, you can simply uh, follow these notes. But uh, I just got four simple things that I think are relevant to what um, our lives are about today. And uh, I believe that God's about to do something pretty amazing in this place. So here's what's up. Jonah finally reluctantly obeys. Jonah finally reluctantly obeys. And so here's number one. Nothing can stop what God wants to accomplish. You know, if you really think about it, God is on a mission. God wants to save the world. Actually, it says in Scripture that God wants none to perish. And so I believe that no matter how rebellious we are and we try to run away or not do God's will, God says, my will is going to be accomplished anyway. And it's, it's kind of weird. Uh, most preachers today that I listen to on the radio or that I hear on TV or that I, that I just hear about, there's a lot of morality teaching in the church. If you do enough good things, then God will bring good things on you. It's kind of a world philosophy of karma. I don't believe in that. I don't believe that Scripture teaches that. I believe that God is going to accomplish His will no matter what. And He wants to use us along the way. We get to just participate. Whether we obey uh, um, humbly or whether we you know, obey reluctantly, God still wants to get His mission done. Listen to this Scripture again The title read, When the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get that. The word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, all right, I'll give you a second chance. You, you have another opportunity. If any of you have teenagers that were rebellious or if you were ever rebellious, one of the best things that you'd want to hear from your parents or teenagers, uh, yeah, that you want to hear is, okay, I'll give you another chance. You want to try that again? My dad was famous for doing that because I would always be trying something, doing something my way to go, do you want to try that again? We have another opportunity to make this right, you know? Or like when I was learning how to mow the grass or learning how to wash the car or learning how to do the dishes, my mom's like, do you want to try to wash this again? Because this is really how it should be done, you know? That's what God does. He goes, okay, Jonah, here's a second opportunity. And listen to how he says it in verse 2. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave you. There's no kind of maybes. There's no soft peddling. God's like, go and do what I said. Any parents out there that say, well, uh, your kid asks you, why do I have to obey what you say? And you go, because I said so. You ever get to that point in your parenting? That's what God's doing. He's saying, because I said so, go do this. So, verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a large city, and it took three days to go through it. I was reading some commentary this week, and it said it was either so large it took three days to walk through it, or it took three days to accomplish what his mission was, to go tell all the different people in the parts of the town that, that he would walk through. Now, it says in chapter 4 that Nineveh was 120,000 people. That's bigger than, than Greeley, the city of Greeley. So where would you start if God commissioned you to go to Greeley or to go to, to Loveland, Fort Collins? Where would you start to, to start prophesying God's word? I mean, would you go to City Hall? Would you go to the courts? Would you go to the police station? Would you just go to Subway and like stand at the corner and people getting lunch? Would you, where would you start? Have you ever thought about that? So Jonah, he just starts walking into town and he says these five Hebrew words. There are really five words in Hebrew. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. There's no please and thank you. There's no manners in there. There's no like, um, if you want to turn around, maybe God. It's just like, listen, you're done. God's just trying to destroy you, so you got 40 days. Uh, it's kind of like, like he, he's had enough. 
He's obeyed God, but he's reluctant about it. And he's like, listen, you got 40 days, and then you're done. And he's hoping, I think, secretly, you're going to be baked. God's going to wipe you out. So just pack your bags. Basically, just pack it up. You got 40 days, and it's over. That's probably his attitude. But here's the deal. God's serious about talking to these Assyrians. He's very serious about Nineveh, and he's like, I'm going to give them a chance. We talked a couple weeks ago about uh, you don't get to choose who you want to forgive. God forgives people anyway. And, and sometimes the people on your I don't want to forgive you list, God is like, no, you should move them on to your I'm going to forgive you because God's working in your life list. And so Jonah is confronted by this um, man, I've got this second chance. God saved me from dying. I can go and tell the truth, oh, whatever. And he goes and he preaches this message. And then he's just kind of like, oh, I'm done with this. I want to give it up. But God is still working in Jonah's life. Do you know what it says that God wants none to perish in our world today? And God wants us to produce spiritual fruit. We're not supposed to just sit around and kind of wait for God to do all the work. Because here's the third thing. God likes to use humanity to accomplish His will. He's not the big famous God in the sky with the long wiped up dynasty beard. And He's like, do a little magic potion over here in Africa. A little magic here in Mexico. A little magic. He's not just waving His fingers making things happen. God says, I'm going to use humanity to accomplish my will. So if humanity would just get along with it. Start doing what I want them to do. If, if I were God, and, and I don't want to be, or if you were God, maybe your attitude would be like, either fish or cut bait. Right? Either get into the way, get into what we're doing, or get out of the way, but i got work to do. That's what I would feel like. If I was a divinity, if I was like a big higher power, I'd be like, listen, either be part of what I'm doing, or move out of the way, but no excuses. Don't talk to me about it. No more lip service. Just do what I want. That's how I would feel. But God is so gracious. God is so kind. His character is so good. And He's so patient that He uses us along the way. So even in Jonah's reluctance, He obeys. And He does these things that God, does, God wants there's this really funny scripture in the New Testament that Jesus, te Jesus tells a parable at the end of Matthew 21. It's really kind of strange. He's talking to these Hebrew people, and they're the Pharisees, they're the leaders of the law, and they get to kind of say what is and what isn't, and they're kind of like the, the religious law keepers, the lawyers, but they know God so well that they know, they know how to make up all the rules, you know what I mean? And so there's this thing, Jesus comes to them in Matthew 21, and he tells this strange parable. Have you heard this before? He says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. And he went to his first son and he said, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. And the son replied, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went out and worked. And then the father went to the second son and he said the same thing to him. And the second son answered, Oh, yes, sir, I will work for you. But he did not go. Which of the two sons did the... Did um, did what his father wanted. Was it the first son that said, no, nah, I'm not going to work for you, but then he went out and did it? Like, hey, go mow the lawn. No, nah, I'm not going to mow the lawn. Oh, I guess I better go do it. And do it. Or was it the second son that said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go mow the grass. Sure, I'll, I'll go do that for you. And then he didn't do it. Which one did what the father wanted? And in the parable, it's the first one. And Jesus says... I tell you the truth, even the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God in, ahead of you because they listened to John the Baptist's message and they repented of their sin and they came forward and they did what God is calling them to do. You know what this parable tells me? Is that we give a lot of lip service to God, don't we? Oh, sure, God, I'll do that. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'll, I won't do that again. Or, yeah, I'd be glad to go and tell my neighbor about you. Or, I'd be glad to go, you know, live a life of faith so that others can see you. And we do a lot of this lip service Christianity. I think God would rather have reluctant obedience than lip service disobedience. Don't you think? I mean, God is about, hey, just, you need to do what I said. You need to accomplish my will. You need to be part of what I'm doing. Um, or if not, I'm going to use other people around you, but I'm going to accomplish my will. 
Here's number two if you want to fill this in. Humility is a game changer. I believe that humility is a game changer in our faith. Uh, when you walk in humility, you, uh, you allow the Spirit of God to work in you and among you and around you. And God uses humility. One of the greatest sins in the Scripture is the sin of pride. The sin of uh, making yourself a God. The sin of elevating yourself above what God intends to do. And the minute we elevate ourselves up, God says, uh, I need to knock you down a few pegs so that we can all be humble together. There's some people that never sense the Spirit of God. They never sense that God wants to work in them or speak through them or talk through them or invite another believer in. Or another. And it turns out that it's because we got all this pride going on. And we don't really allow God to get in and kind of use us the way He wants. Does that make sense? Here's the scripture that I love in Jonah chapter 3, verse 5 to 8. The Ninevites then believed God. We, we should just stop there. The whole town believed the message. They all came to God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. You know what sackcloth is? Imagine goat hair woven burlap. And you take off your nice cotton shirt and you put on a burlap shirt. Oh, and burlap pants. And then you walk around for a month and a half and you don't shower and you don't clean and you just wear this stuff. Oh, oh, and by the way, they also sat in the dust, which is another reference for putting on ashes. You take burnt ashes from the fire. You know how burnt ashes get everywhere? If you ever try to step out of fire, poof, this puff of ashes goes everywhere. Now, I want you to take all those ashes on top of your burlap sackcloth and put those on your head and just rub ashes all over yourself. That's called humility. That's what this whole town does. Verse 6, when, Jonah war when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, by the way, he didn't go to the king first. Did you notice that? He just started coming into town. Hey, you're all going to die. you got 40 days. 40 days, he's a 7-Eleven, get a slurpee. you got 40 days, watch yourself. He's not with the king. Finally, the king hears the message. Listen to what the king does. Four things. He rose from his throne. He took off his royal robes. He covered himself with sackcloth. And he sat down in the dust. The king did that. This is the proclamation that he then issued Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let people or animals or herds or flocks taste anything 40 days. Don't let them eat or drink. How many days can you go without water? Exactly. So he's like, nothing. Zero. But let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and violence. You know what the key is in here? is behavior. The key is actually saying, okay, God, I'm going to repent enough that I'm going to change my, my, my uh, stature. I'm going to go from sitting to standing. I'm going to change my clothes. I'm going to take off what I think is comfortable in my style. And I'm going to put on your style, which is, God said, humility is sackcloth. I'm going to go down and I'm going to sit in the dirt. And then I'm not going to eat anything. Has, has any of you fasted for a month? Has any of you tried to fast for 40 days? Has any of you tried to fast for 24 hours? Not a diet like i got to lose weight fast, but like a prayer fast. We used to do this thing in my youth group where we would do 36-hour uh, famine. Just call it a 30-hour 30, 30 famine. We'd go um, in the evening and a whole morning and a whole day, and then we'd have a meal on the next on the next evening. You know, the first couple days is the hardest part to fast because your stomach's killing you, and you're hungry, and your blood sugar's crashing, and you're like, oh, I'm not going to make it. Oh, that's the hardest thing. And then you get to eat something or whatever. Imagine going 40 days. Jesus fasted 40 days a number of times. Moses fasted 40 days at least twice. Elijah fasted 40 All these people fasted and they connected with God in ways that we don't know how to connect with God. Something tied to our blood sugar and our body system and the way God wired us and the way God wants to connect us. If you want to try it, you should try it. Do it for the right reasons, though. Don't just try it, uh, you know, to see how how it goes. Do it to connect with God. Make sure you get medical attention if you need it. 
But God says, listen, if you can forego your own pleasures in the world, the own, your own things, then I will work in you and I will meet you in ways that you've never been met before. And so all these people are doing this. Um, I think it's pretty amazing. When we repent of our sin, when we truly repent and our behavior changes, God hears us. It's a game changer. Humility is a game changer. When we walk in pride and we continue to do the things we're doing and we continue our habits, we continue to, to have the attitude and continue all these things, God's like, I'll just I'll wait for you to, to be done, but I, I, I want to work with you. I want action. You want to know something ironic? The people of Israel never repented as much as the people of Nineveh did. If you look at the whole nation of Israel, how many prophets were sent to Israel. A dozen at least. A couple dozen. And the Israelites would kill their prophet. People would not like the message they hear from God. So they do away with the prophet. And they keep their behavior. Do you know that this pagan culture. The Assyrians. They fully repented. The entire town. That's more than Israel ever did. And I want to tell you something about this king. For the king to actually rise from his throne, take off his robes, walk down into the dust, and sit down is a model of what Christ did in Philippians chapter 2. you know that passage? Philippians 2. It says, your attitude, Paul says, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who was in very nature God, but did not consider himself equal with God, so he humbled himself, became like a man, came like a servant and he died on the cross. You know that Jesus, like this king of Nineveh, humbled himself and said, I'm going to do the will of God. And he came for us. We have a relationship with God because another king humbled himself like this king. Here's a question for you. What are you waiting for? What, what are you waiting for in your life that, uh, that you don't want to be humble about? You know? Is there a pride in your life that says, no, nah, I've really got to keep this, I've got to keep this opinion? I've really got to keep this attitude with other people because if I let go of this, then I got no territory, I got no leverage, I got nothing. Then what's going to happen, right? God says, if you let that go, I'll work in you. Uh, funny story, when I was in college, I went to the school of Biola down in LA, a Christian college, and every once in a while I would bring a bunch of my friends to my parents' house because uh, I liked them. And I like my parents, and I like their house. And anytime these friends would come over, uh, they would be super enamored by my parents' house. It wasn't anything special. It was just a little house, no big deal, just a single-level ranch house. But they had cool things in the house. And so these people that would come in, we didn't have any money or anything elaborate. I grew up a missionary kid. We always got the hand-me-down everything, do you remember? And these kids that were from my class, my school and college, they'd come in the house, and my parents would greet them with a hug. My mom would cook for them this amazing food. My dad would tell them all these missionary stories about living in Africa, and crashing an airplane, and you know, praying prayers and doing these things. These kids were super enamored by my parents. And we had this uh, this thing called a signature wall. Have you ever heard of this? My parents like let people sign their hallway with black permanent marker pens. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm in high school. I'm like, you don't let me write on the walls when I'm a kid. And then you let everybody else come and write all over our walls. And we had signatures for like 15 years. People, the short people, they would all sign down here. And the tall, six foot five, seven foot four people. We had a guy who was like seven foot four come in and he signed his name upside down on the crown molding at the top of the hallway. Like, oh yeah, I'm so tall, I can do this upside down. And we had this huge wall, and it was like, people were super enamored by my parents. But I wasn't. I was still that college kid that was like, whatever, they're just my parents. I was so used to them, that I wasn't like enamored by their stories or their tricks or their fun things or the games or the cooking. I was like bored. You know what I mean? What's that phrase, familiarity breeds content? So I'm like, whatever, they're just my parents. And then we drive back home to or go back to school, and these kids were just, they kept talking about my parents. I'm like, whatever, it's just my dad. But I think the thing is this, when you're not so familiar with something, it can stir something in you. Make sense? And this king is not familiar with the people of Israel. He's not, other than stomping them out, he's not familiar with their God. Jonah is a foreigner. He comes into town. He's bleach white from the whale vomit. 
And so, of course, they're listening to his message, and they get enamored by this God, so they totally repent. Can I teach you a lesson in Hebrew? The word for repent is the word neha. N-A-H-A-M. Neha. Do you know there was a prophet named Neha? Two books after the book of Jonah. It goes Jonah, Micah, Neha, Habakkuk. So Neha is two books after Jonah. His name means repent. Do you know what the people, do you know what the book of Nahum is about? Destruction of the town of Nineveh. God has had it with Nineveh because one simple generation after Jonah, they all turn back to their carnal ways, their pagan ways, their whatever. And God says, that's it. You don't want to live in repentance? You want to walk away? And God judges them. It's crazy to think that God says humility is a game changer. Here's number three. God's character is to forgive. You know, in the Old Testament, it looks like God wants to just pack it in, pack all the, the trouble in and make everybody suffer. It's not true. God, His nature is to forgive. His character is to forgive. And now that Christ has come and we have the Holy Spirit, His nature is to forgive. Listen to the king in verse 9. Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from His fierce anger so that we won't perish. He's listening to the impending doom that's around, but he's like, who knows? Maybe your God will save us. A little uh, history lesson here on Nineveh. All the surrounding towns around Assyria right then, they were all coming to attack the Assyrians. They were 100 miles away. Historically, uh, they were ready to meet their destruction. God was sending other people to come and destroy them. But, God, but they listened to God. They repented. They turned away. God's character is to forgive, but we also need to sort of get out of the way of God's judgment. We need to repent of that. Uh, I read this week that God's judgment is like a rumbling train coming down the tracks. And it's coming so fast and so hard and the whistle's blowing and the light's turning. If you live anywhere near trains or out around here, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, do you think it's wise to stay on the tracks and hit the train? Huh. Genius. Smart. Smarter than I thought. It's the same with God's judgment. God says, if you repent, then I will relent. I will not judge you if you walk away from your sin. And God calls us to that. Here's number four. And we'll close. God sees you. He is patiently paying attention. God is patiently paying attention to you. He sees you. He watches you. He knows you. He listens to you. He hears your cry. He knows what your needs are. He sees you. And He's paying attention. And He wants to act in your life. Here's what the verse is. Verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they repent, turned from their evil ways, He relented. It didn't bring on them the destruction that He had threatened. So God watches you and He says, are you going to repent? Are you going to turn from that behavior? Are you going to change from the living and the life of that sin? Or are you going to, uh, are you going to, are you going to live in that and stay in that? Because in one way or another, I'm coming, God says. So God says, if you turn from your ways, I'll free you. He sees you. Now, I don't know how many of you grew up in uh, that old school religion that felt guilty and shame. And you felt like, uh, oh man, the pastor sees kind of waving his finger too much. Or uh, God is sort of a judging God and he's got his hands on me and he's going to just, he's going to punish me. That's not what I'm talking Religion does that. Religion is full of rules and it makes you feel a certain way. If you don't do enough good, then God is kind of slowly squishing you. You know what I mean? That's not what grace is about. That's not what we preach here. The scripture says that when we ask forgiveness, God forgives Wipes our slate clean. We walk free with God. He's watching us because He's patiently paying attention to see if we'll walk with Him. I want to close by uh, reading this Oswald Chambers quote. You know that Oswald Chambers lived from 1874 to 1917? Do you know that this church was built in 1903? And Oswald Chambers in England was still writing probably and was thinking about this theology. Listen to this. This is on my Facebook page. The characteristic of a Christian is that they have the right not to insist on their rights. That would mean that I refuse to do certain things that would cause my brother or sister to stumble. I have the right to not sin. 
And he goes on. To me, the restriction may seem a little absurd or narrow-minded. I can do the things without any harm. I mean, come on, who am I going to hurt, right? But Paul's argument is that he reserves the right to suffer the loss of all things rather than put an occasion to fall in his brother's way. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to forego our rights. It, it, if you want to see that again, it's on my Facebook. You can look it up or I can share it with you after. But here's the thing. You can choose to not sin. You can choose to not do something to cause your brother or sister to stumble in front of you. God says, if you can choose that, I will walk with you and give you the power of the Holy Spirit to grow and to, to have power to walk with me. It's not all just about you, but you have power to not sin and fall into the trap living your life just for yourself. I want to close by uh, telling you this story. There was a person who talked to me last weekend and they said that the woman of faith um, the woman of faith weekend, maybe it might have been this weekend there was a Promise Keepers one up at the Budweiser Center and there was a woman of faith one and the woman who was in the movie Blindside, you know the one that Sandra Bullock played in the Blindside movie with that, that kid Michael, the big football player, uh, the real woman, the mother I don't know what her real name is. She speaks at these engagements. And she wears this little bracelet, this little, you know, those rubber bracelets? Yeah, thanks. So um, she wears these rubber bracelets, and one of them says, turn around. All it says is turn around. Because she said that's how she found this Michael guy. What's his last name? Or. Or, correct. Thank you. That was a, that was a test. Uh, and so she has this thing that says turn around because she said when she was driving, she saw Michael walking down the street and they passed him. And the Holy Spirit told her, turn around. So she turned around and she talked to this kid and he was out on his own, kind of like living a life without any parents and without any good hope in his life. So she took him into her house and he's this six foot five giant and then these little white people and uh, they kept him and, and adopted him and he became a child of theirs and then he became this professional football player for the Ravens and it's this whole story in the movie but her gospel story is turn around and in the scriptures turn around is to repent and God calls us to just simply turn around to simply repent. He's paying attention enough that if we just turn around from our life of sin, our life of rebellion, our life of walking away from Him, God simply says, I'll receive you. Last week I asked you, what's the measure of rebellion to be rebellion? I mean, is it just an inch? Is it a foot? How much do you have to rebel to rebel? I mean, do you have to rebel like a mile? Do you have to actually kill somebody? Do you actually have to, you know, live a certain... God says any bit of rebellion is rebellion. It's missing the mark. And God calls us to walk holy with Him. Do you know that we can never make the mark? We don't have the power to do it ourselves. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus died. And so we're closing. Our opportunity is just to continue to come back to Jesus and say, Lord, I want to turn around for my life and I want to follow and seek we're going to do that this morning. Let's pray. God, we come into this house here on Sunday mornings, not because we have to, but because you want us to. 